So this video uh, highlights the two points I think that Paul really makes at the very conclusion of his, this last section of, Phil, of Philippians that we're looking at today. One is how can we learn to stay joyful with all the ups and downs of life? Because life is like a roller coaster with all the ups and downs. How do we stay joyful? And then secondly, why, why, why can we be happy? Why can we be joyful? Why can we be content no matter the circumstances? So today as we conclude our series on joy in the book of Philippians, we're just going to ask the question, what's the secret? What's the secret to contentment? We're going to look at some of the last words that the Apostle Paul wrote, ever wrote, here at the very end of the book of Philippians in chapter 4. Now this guy, Paul, this man... He has been through everything, right? He has just been through everything. Shipwrecks, false imprisonment, slander, riots. People tried to stone him to death. Uh, He's had successes. He's had failures. And yet in all this, this elderly man in his last days of his life, sitting all by himself in prison, uh, he writes this in Philippians 4, starting in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you... Uh, at last, you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Wouldn't you love to be able to say that all the time? No matter what the circumstances, I'm okay. I'm content. I'm calm. I'm not stressed. I'm not angry. I'm not freaking out. I'm content in all circumstances. Uh, A guy by the name of Stephen Mosley, he's an author, and he writes a true story. He writes about the early days of of World War II. And he writes in a book called The Secrets of the Mustard Seed. Uh, He writes about what happened in the Japanese POW camp right after uh, Japan invaded China. It's the very beginning of the war, and he writes this. The ragged European internees standing in rows in the center of Shangtung prison compound feared the worst as the POW camp warden prepared to read his verdict. They had heard rumors of atrocities in other prisoner of war camps that occupied China. The accused man was a small bespeckled priest named Father Darby. He had been caught slipping eggs under his cassock. Uh, As he prayed at the compound, eggs were slipped to him by sympathetic Chinese villagers. And then he would pass those eggs on to the other prisoners. And now the prison warden announced that he would make an example of Father Darby. The weary prisoner shuddered. Would this gentle priest be tortured uh, or would he be shot? And the warden announced his verdict and the sentence fell down to him and it was totally silent. And the sentence said, you will have one and a half months in solitary confinement. At which there was a pause and then all the prisoners erupted in joy. Jubilant roars and laughter and claps that shocked the Japanese officials because he did not know what they all knew that Father Darby had served as a Trappist monk. And he thrived. For 25 years in, minist- in, in a monastery under strict silence and solitude. And as the shoulders shook their head, we can't believe just this happened. And as the Japanese shoulders shook their head in disbelief, the uncomprehending, the priest marched off to his tar- dark, tiny cell, joyfully humming a hymn. One and a half months of solitary confinement was the best gift they could possibly have given him. <laughs> Then Mosley writes this, the only difference between in hellish isolation and heavenly peace was his attitude and his experience. And that's what Paul talks about. In other words, it's not what happens to us that determines the quality of our lives. It's how we interpret what happens to us that counts. See, life doesn't just happen to us directly. It's mediated through our own point of view. We define what's important and what's not, what's happy, what's sad, what's joyful, what's not. And that's what Paul talks about in this verse. Look at that word learned. He says, I have learned to be content. The Greeks had lots of different words for the word learned, but this had a very particular meaning. This Greek word that says learned here meant learned by experience by experience. He says contentment is learned. It's not something that's instant. Even uh, it's something that the Apostle Paul learned over lots and lots of years. Ever wish you can just be more content? It's not a prayer thing. It's not a gift thing. It's not a faith issue. It's a learned 
thing. It's a learned skill. It's a learned experience. And when we say learning contentment, let me just highlight real quick what contentment is not. Contentment does not mean complacent. Yeah, you know, whatever happens is fine. That's not what it means. Paul had definite opinions on things, didn't he? He had goals. He had tasks to do, but he was content. Content does also does not mean lazy. It doesn't mean I'll just sit around and do nothing. I'm just kind of, you know, content. Because Paul was the furthest person from anyone that could be called lazy. And it also does not mean escape. It doesn't mean, you know, I imagine if we were all just sitting on a poolside cruise ship with a little umbrella in our drink, we would be fun and, and we'd be reading a novel and we'd be content. That's not what it means either. Paul wrote this from a prison cell in Rome awaiting execution. This was not an escape thing for him. So what does it mean? For Paul, when he writes contentment, he means abiding peace no matter the circumstances. No matter the circumstances. Now, when you piece together Paul's life, what he's written in other books, what he writes in the Philippians in these last few verses, we can learn some very specific things about what he learned about contentment. And the number one thing, if you want to be content, the secret to contentment is learn to avoid comparisons. Comparisons will get you every time. Learn to avoid comparisons with other people, with other situations, with other times. Uh, he says, I've learned to be content with whatever, whatever the circumstances. And partly that came from him not comparing himself or his circumstances to what you perceive to be better circumstances. What you assume would be better circumstances. See, the Bible says that God came so that you can have abundant life. That word abundant, when that comes up in the gospel, it's defined as life and its abounding fullness of joy and strength for spirit, soul, and body. That's what it means to live a life of contentment. See, in a sense, contentment is actually our witness to a very stressed out world very stressed out, scared, COVID-focused world. It's a big deal. Contentment is a big deal. It's an eternal deal. It's a kingdom mission deal to live a life of contentment because people watch. Why are those Christians so content? Why are those Christians so stressed out? And they make judgment calls. Because if you're discontent, what happens is you miss opportunities to serve and to join God in what he's doing right now. Now, if you're not feeling like you're living a life, bearing testimony to the abundant life that Jesus could have for you right here, right now, because the reality is there's always going to be people out there that make more than you. More money, have better health than you, have greater opportunities than you, seem to have fewer problems than you. So what do you do about that? Well, Steve made up a word last Sunday, and I thought, I'm going to make up a word this Sunday too. And so it's a Latin principle, and it addresses this, and it's called so whatium. All right? <laughs> so whatium. You think people might have a better life and more money and a better house and more opportunities than you? So whatium. All right, those things have no bearing, absolutely no bearing at all on your personal happiness, on your personal joy. Proverbs 14, 30 says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. See, there's three misconceptions about happiness. And this verse is kind of talking about that. Some, some misconceive that I must have what others have to be happy. That's the myth behind every fad, every fashion. It's just not true. I don't have to have what everybody else has to be happy. Or the uh, misconception that I have to be a, have approval. I gotta be liked by everybody to be happy. That in order for me to be happy, everyone's gotta know what a great job I do and how happy I am. So many people try so hard to win the approval, approval of other people, but it's impossible. We just can't go through life without disapproval. In fact, if you do anything, anything at all, there will be people that disapprove of it. It's a guaranteed promise. Think of this, even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could not please everybody. And only a fool would try to do what even Jesus couldn't pull off. So why are we trying? You don't need the approval of everybody else to be happy. 
The next one is, I have to have more to be happy. Another misconception. In a famous quote by Hugh, uh, Howard Hughes, he was asked, how much money does it take to make a person happy? And he says, oh, it's always just a little bit more. Always just a little bit more. That's why Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. So if you have children, if you have grandchildren, if you have friends that have children in your life, which means if you're sitting here right now, because that's all of us, we need to understand we actually have a role to teach children what contentment is about and to avoid comparisons. Learn contentment because they catch it. Everything's caught more than taught. And, and we need to help them understand the process of saving, the process of delayed gratification. Because if they see us constantly striving, striving, striving to get more, to always move up, to upgrade, to borrow a little bit, and always whining about it, always expressing dissatisfaction with something in your life that can be better, they're going to learn to be that way. They catch what they see in us. So maybe, though, it's not about money for you. Maybe you don't want to get rich in terms of money, but you want more of other things. You always just want more. People always just want more, more significance, more power, more say, more people listening to me, more control, more of how I want it, more, more, more. And what he's saying here is more is a trap. More is always a trap. Always wanting something else can lead to a trap that leads to ruin and destruction. Kind of like this commercial here. Have a look at this video. See, more is a trap. <clears throat> Got to have more of this. I need to have more of that. I must have more respect. I must have more say. I must have more power. I must have more. It's, it starts with comparison. That's where it leads. It starts with comparison. So what I'm saying here is stop. Just stop comparing. Your situation is your situation. Stop comparing your marriage to other marriages, your house to other houses, your kids to other kids, uh, your job to other jobs. If you want to learn commitment, you avoid comparison. And then, Paul highlights, you learn to adjust, to be flexible to changing circumstances. We learn to adjust. See, life's like a ride on a swing, and there's ups and downs, there's ups and downs, and either you learn to go with it or you learn to just scream, why, 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 and you just keep going that way. But the reality is life equals change. Life always equals change. I mean, the economy goes up and down, health goes up and down, house prices go up and up, bad example. <laughs> but it's full of change, right? It's just full of change. Personally, I think the key to adjusting to life's always changing circumstances is actually a good sense of humor. We got to laugh about it. We're always presented with and surrounded by change. You got to have a sense of humor. For instance, how many anti-vaxxers does it take to change a light bulb? It's not my job to tell you. Go Google it and do your own research. I was thinking later. It's very funny. See, there's lots of change in the world these days. So how do you handle it? How do you handle change? When things get shaken up a little bit and things are different and they're not the way they were and I don't like the way they are, but they're not the way they were, and how do we do this? If we don't learn how to handle change, you're gonna be miserable and you're gonna make everybody else around you miserable. Paul writes in verse 12 of Philippians 4, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. Now, notice what he says here. He names both well-fed and plenty, not just want. He doesn't talk about just being hungry. See, a lot of times I think we have a harder time to be content when things are going well. 
When things are actually going pretty good, we end up having a harder time being content. Yet he writes, be content in every situation. See, most people are always looking for a different situation. But you're gonna miss what God is doing right here, right now, in the opportunities that are at this present if you don't pay attention to what he's doing now and always think about what else could happen. I'm gonna read a poem by a guy by the name of Jason Lehman. He was 14 years old, okay? 14 years old when he wrote this. It goes like this. It was spring, but I was, it was summer I wanted. The warm days, the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves, the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted. The beautiful snow, the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring that I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted. The freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 that I wanted. To be mature and sophisticated. I was middle aged, but it was 20 that I wanted. The youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. My life was over. And I never got what I wanted. A 14-year-old kid wrote that. See, the secret of contentment is not getting what you want. It's wanting what you have. Paul's saying, I will not let life victimize me. When Paul talks about this, he's also not talking just about a bad decision that he's made. He's talking about unfair treatment that he has no control over, abuse at the hands of other people that he has no control over. And yet he's, he's saying, I'm not gonna let them manipulate me into self-pity and to sorrow. I'm not gonna let these external circumstances affect my inward response. It's amazing what he's writing here to these people. Let me explain what he means here. He's talking about three kinds, three kinds of circumstances that we have to deal with in life. There are those circumstances that we can control, and I do. In other words, I don't like what's on TV. I have a remote, I change the channel. I'm hungry, I get up to the kitchen, and I go make myself a sandwich. I can fix those things. But then those are things that I can control, but I don't. And that's usually about laziness or fear. You need to change the situation, and if you just get up and do something about it, it would change. But then there's those things that you can't do anything about. Circumstances I cannot control. That's what Paul's talking about here. That there are many situations in life where you just can't control it, and that's where you need contentment. That's where we need to learn to breathe and stop and be still and know God and trust God in that circumstance. And that leads to Paul's third point that he writes about. Secret to contentment, I need to learn to trust in Christ's power. Now this part's not easy. This is actually not easy at all. Sometimes it's very difficult to put your trust in Jesus' power when you don't see him doing something now, working on something now, fixing the situation right now now that's when it's hard. So what do you do? I think what you do there is you look in the rearview mirror. At that point you look back and you remember how he has helped you in the past. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And he's not speaking theoretically here, remember? He's, he's thinking back specifically to things that he's gone through when he had to be lowered in a basket to escape that city on the outside of the wall. When he had to, uh, he remembered when he was shipwrecked. He remembered when he was shipwrecked again. He remembered those times when he was whipped and, and beaten. He remembers those times when he was thrown in prison. And he says, you know what I've learned in all that? Jesus always comes through. He always comes through. He remembers those times. He remembers how Jesus came through and he's learned contentment. And he can lean on that and look ahead to the times when he doesn't see Jesus right now, but he knows that Jesus will do something. And he can relax. And he doesn't spread his misery amongst other people. Verse 13 of chapter 4. For I can do everything through Jesus, through Christ, who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ. Everything through Christ. 
What do you need to do to make that possible? What do you need to do so that you can lean into that fact, that truth? Do you need to get control? What's, what's the one thing in your life right now that seems impossible to control? Do you need to get control of a bad habit in your life? Time, your mouth, your temper, your watching habits, anything. Do you need to start something you haven't started? Do you need to stop something that you have been doing and you're powerless and you can't stop it and now you got to lean on somebody else and that's Jesus because we just can't do it with our own willpower often. However, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now that doesn't mean he's going to miraculously snap his fingers and all your difficult situations are going to go away. And a lot of Christians get messed up by that. A lot of people new to church get messed up by that. See, Paul had a horrible weakness. He wrote about it. He called it a thorn in his flesh. And it affected him so badly. He begged God three times to take it away from him. And God said, no, no, no. And then elsewhere he writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, This word here, sufficient, that uses sufficient, it's the same Greek word that we translate as contentment in Philippians. It's the same word. In other words, God's saying that no matter what your external circumstances, whether it's about healing, whether it's about disease, whether it's about good times or bad times, it's his grace. It's his love. It's his power. It's his presence that will provide contentment when there's all kinds of weird circumstances going on all around you. And then he makes the final point. He says, I need to learn to trust God to both define and meet my needs. See, he thanks the Philippians for their support. Because remember when people were in prison back then, they didn't get three meals a day and exercise in a yard and Sky TV and stuff. They, they had to count on other people to bring food or they would go hungry. So people are supporting Paul while he's in prison. And here at the very end of this letter for, for giving to his ministry, he says this. It was good of you to share in my troubles. You sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches riches in Christ Jesus. Now notice, he doesn't say God will meet all your greeds. He doesn't do a typo on this. It's all your needs he takes care of. See, we got a long list of the things. I have a long list of all the things I think I need. And some of those things on my list are not really needs. They're wants. They're lists of more. It's about bank balances and houses and those kind of things. But there are some things we actually need that should be on our prayer list, but we don't have it on our needs list. Things like peace and patience and trust and calm and kindness and understanding. See, that's why when you need to let God both define and feel what your real needs are, that's what happens. He'll go ahead and he will meet those needs. We need to let God define the needs. Even wanting more of God. I want more of God. I want more of God. That's a trap. Because usually that means you've already self-defined what more of God looks like. And God's like, that's not me and that's not what you need. This is the side of me you need right now. Again and again and again, Paul reminds us, he tells us, he almost begs us in all these letters, all these letters we've looked at this year, now in Philippians right now, life is about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about your wants. It's about Jesus, about who Jesus is, about what Jesus has done on our behalf and what he's doing now on the behalf of others that he wants us to join him in, in reaching out to. So I just want to wrap up our whole study right now on this book of Philippians. Now remember, Philippians written by Paul, written by other Christians who were under severe, severe persecution by Caesar Nero, the most wicked tyrant who ever ruled the Roman Empire. These people were in constant danger A persecution, constant danger of death under the leadership of this guy. Devastation always happened under this guy. And yet in the whole book of Philippians, we don't detect a note of panic or chaos or worry. Not one. 
Why am I pointing this out? Because in that lack of panic, in that lack of anxiety, that teaches us something. It teaches us that we can have contentment no matter what the circumstances. We can live in joy no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on in the headlines, in the news, no matter what's going to happen in the next COVID level announcement, no matter what's going on in our own church, we really need to get our hearts and our heads around this idea that we're actually called to be a witness to a stressed out generation. And we can't do that if we're stressing out ourselves. I want you to, I'm gonna finish with this little writing. I want you to listen to what a witness that's like that has written. Um, Ian and Joan Thompson sent this to me. It's from a friend of theirs named Agnes, a a Romanian lady. She's uh, one of the pillars of the church, a a light, an inspiration to their home church back in England called The Well. Listen to what she writes. I'm convinced that once we're in heaven, we will never regret letting go of the wrongs and forgiving others in the same way our Father has forgiven us. We will only regret the bitterness we harbored and the anger we held onto while on earth. When we see Jesus again, when we see the risen Jesus, scars still marking his wrist and side, we will wish we trusted him more to empower us to turn the tide of hate and loss and take our place as agents of a better kingdom. When we see the mighty throne of God and understand fully all the justice rests in his hands, We'll wish we had extended more olive branches of peace to those around us. For now, I simply encourage you to park under the waterfall of a better blessing. Remember from the outset, it's a blessing you did not earn or deserve. It's the blessing of a perfect father with extravagant love, a father who has never lost sight of you and will never let you go. He is a perfect Abba who will not leave you powerless, but who will make you powerful, powerful enough to extend to others the blessing he is extending to you. Let me read that last part. (coughs) He's a perfect Abba who will not leave you powerless, but who will make you powerful, powerful enough to extend to others, to each other, the blessing he is extending to you. What a phenomenal woman to write something like this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, soak us to the bones, soak us to our soul with this sense of contentment, with a sense of peace that passes all understanding, with a sense of joy, with a sense of your presence that we can't help but overflow with blessing and peace and kindness and reconciliation in all things. Help us to realize that this is part of what you've called us to be as part of your mission, our purpose as a church, as friends, as people who follow Jesus together, that we would live with an abundant life that overflows to others regardless of the circumstances. And when we walk around jittery or nervous or not sure what's going to happen, help us to stay calm and know your peace today, Jesus. And God, make us a witness of your love, of your presence, of your contentment, of your peace with each other and to those who do not yet know you. So when they see us, they see you, Jesus. When they hear us, they hear you, Jesus. And they sense your presence and your peace and your calm. And we pray this in Jesus' name, as in all things. Amen. Amen.